Shalom, Shalom, Chavrim, and welcome to Treasured Inheritance Ministry with myself, Aliyah, today for an exciting, challenging, powerful teaching that we are going to enjoy together today in the presence of Yeshua, and we praise Him and we welcome His presence in to be with us, to be among us, to be within us, speaking to us the truth that He wants us to hear today, and that is the exciting part. Whenever we get to a teaching, it's always about Abba Father, what is it that you want to share with me today? What is it that you want to say to me today? And so, Yeshua, we welcome you in. We welcome you and we praise you. We thank you. We worship you. We give you all the glory. We commit this time to you. We know you are with us. We know that you are manifest among us. We two or three are gathered in your name. There you are, Abba Father. And we thank you for this. Yeshua, I pray that you will just touch the lives of those who are listening today, that you will touch all of our hearts and lives and speak to us through your word today, the message message that you have for us, the word that you have to speak to us through the lives of these women who were incredibly brave and courageous. And Father, speak to us about what we need to do in our generation, what we need to learn from them and how we can truly, truly feel the impact of what they did in our lives today. We thank you, Yeshua. We praise you. We thank you for your word. Your word is truth and we thank you for it. Yeshua, we pray this in your mighty name. Amen. Now, it is good to have you with me today. We are going to be talking about Zelophehad's daughters. Now, you might be saying, wow, that is a mouthful. Who was this Zelophehad? And you know how great were his daughters? They were absolutely incredible. These girls have so much to teach us. These are truly our matriarchs and matriarchs of faith, matriarchs of ancient Israel, and they are incredible. And I'm kind of going to take you to the end of a little bit of a story before I take you to the beginning of the story where we find them. Joshua 17 verse 3 to 6 says the following. Now Zelophehad, son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, had no sons. So Zelophehad had no sons, but only daughters whose names were Machla, Noah, Hogla, Milka, and Terza. Now they went to Eliezer, the priest, Joshua, son of Nun, and the leaders and said, Yahweh commanded Moses to give us an inheritance among our relatives. So Joshua gave them an inheritance along with the brothers of their father, according to Yahweh's command. I have kind of just taken you to the end of a beautiful story, but I want to kind of paint you this picture. Zelophehad's daughters appear before Joshua in the promised land in Joshua 17. The Israelites here have already conquered the land. They are in the promised land. And, you know, this is a beautiful culmination of a journey that I'm going to take you into in a moment. It's not only the journey of Exodus, but this is a journey right here where we see these girls come to Joshua. We see them come to Eliezer, the priest, and say, Yahweh commanded Moses to give us an inheritance. Now give it to us. It is saying, yes, this is what was commanded. We are here to receive it. We are not tarrying. We are not waiting. We are here because it was promised to us from the mouth of Moses through the mouth of Yahweh. Give it to us. And Joshua, it says immediately, Joshua gave them an inheritance along with the brothers of their father. And that means it doesn't mean their brothers. Remember, it doesn't mean, remember, Zalofi had here, he has no sons. It means brothers of their father. It means their uncles. Their uncles also got an inheritance. They were all of the tribe of Manasseh. And so this is the journey of a family. Zalofi had family. And they were brave daughters who dared to speak up. So in this context, they approached the new leader of Israel, that's Joshua, along with the priestly leadership, Eliezer, who we will see was actually with Moses when this promise was made and they approached them but also the many judges who made up the council of decision making remember Moses appointed different judges those who would be judge over 10 over 100 over 500 so they were all together when the girls approached them and they said you know what simple facts Moses promised them an inheritance it is now time to fulfill that promise oath keeping and promise making in the ancient world not only in Israel but in the in you know Hittite culture and Egyptian culture whatever it was oath keeping promise making was so so taken so so seriously and so that is why you know Yahweh 
promised them an inheritance through Moses. Moses spoke this and it was now time to fulfill that promise right here in Joshua 17. But to understand the promises that these girls are asking to be fulfilled, this requires a deeper look at the law of Israel, the Torah of Israel, and how Yahweh himself changed those laws because of these girls, because they dared to rise up, because they dared to speak up, because they dared to go forward. And this is a beautiful journey. So what do we see? Machla, Noah, Hogla, Milka, and Terza. They were so instrumental, and I want to say this first, in determining the rights of women in Israel. So ever since the Torah was given, these girls were instrumental in determining the rights of the women of Israel, what their rights would look like. And their bravery really requires a deeper look. Now, before we get into what they did, their names are symbols of the Exodus journey as it was experienced by their mother. Mothers predominantly in ancient Israelite culture named their daughters. And this reflects a form of matrilineal expression. You might be saying Aaliyah. That is a lot to deal with. What are you actually saying? What is matrilineal? We know we have matriarchal, but we also have matrilineal. Now, there are forms and reflections of matrilineal expression actually throughout the Old Testament. And that just shows, you know, one of the aspects of a matrilineal expression is that women take a very, very strong center stage. And actually it is shown by the fact that women in ancient Israel named their children, predominantly women named their children. And it was usually based on what women experienced. Remember when our very first mother, Chava or Eve, you know, gave birth to her very first born, she said, I've had a son with God. I've had a son with God. So I'm going to name him this. And then every time she has a different child, she names him something else based on her experience. This was how it worked. And right from the very first mother of our entire world, matrilineal expression was given. Also, you know, Children were often called by the connection that they had with their mother. And so we see this quite often. And here we have this matrilineal expression. So her daughters, even though we don't know the name of Zalofihad's wife, we do know that she's expressing her Exodus journey through the names of her daughters, through the names of her children as she experienced it. So we can get kind of a deeper look into their mother. You know, perhaps she died when they themselves were very young. Maybe she died giving birth to her final daughter. Maybe she died at some other stage. We don't know much about her, what happened to her. She's not alive. So, you know, at some stage she passed away. And we know, though, about her life experience through the exodus, through the naming of her children. So her first child is Machla. Machla is actually a word that means weak or it means weary. It means a woman in travail who is sick. So this may, you know, express their mother's experience of childbirth or or maybe an expression of her experience during her pregnancy. I know that there are many women that say, gosh, I never want to be pregnant again because I was so ill during my pregnancy. You know, we think that this is our 21st century experience. It is not. These women had all these same similar experiences and they maybe got sick and, and, you know, mortality birth rate deaths is was was so high you know women dying as well as their children dying these women they survived them their mother maybe felt ill but machla means weak or it means weary but it particularly means a woman who is in travail so again we could say maybe machla was born um being weak being a weak child or maybe she was a sickly child but the the word also means a woman who is sick a woman who is in travail so it can't maybe be machla as a, a weak baby but more as her mother experiencing a weakness or a illness or a sickness during her pregnancy or during the birth noah means to move or to wander and this really speaks for itself this is not wonder like daydreaming this is wander like i'm wandering around noah was born in the time where the exodus was in full swing and where the israelites were wandering in that wilderness 
Hogla is actually a partridge. <laughs> now, there were no partridges, obviously, in the wilderness, but there was quail. Remember, the Israelites ate in abundance after they were complaining about the manna. They had this quail come on down. And the partridge is very much like a, a peacock or it's a pheasant. And it is actually in the same family as a quail. So it could kind of be Hogla or Hogla's name could be that expression of experience of, you know, when there was this provision of the quail, when these birds fell out of the sky and they kind of maybe looked like a partridge or a pheasant or some kind of, kind of chicken or whatever it's looking like or some kind of a peacock over here. And uh, it's really that expression of we were provided this food. So maybe Hogla was born during that time period where Yahweh provided them those birds that fell out of the sky. That would be really cool because then we have kind of almost a set time period for Hogla's birth. And it was definitely around this time period. That's why she has this name. Milka means queen. And obviously this is a more pleasant experience from a mother's side. We see kind of this joy starting to come in because obviously Milka meaning queen it's a beautiful beautiful name and uh yeah who wonders you know what her mother must have imagined for her life or maybe thought of for her life and the final daughter is Terza now Terza is you know, her name means beauty or pleasant, and it may describe the appearance of Terza. But in actual fact, and we will see, and you will see through this teaching, Terza's legacy became incredibly powerful. And also it was, you know, connected with beauty and pleasantness, not only Terza, but also later the city that is connected with her. And giving you a little bit of a spoiler alert there. But, you know, Terza as herself, her name means beauty or pleasant. Maybe it described the way that she looked. We can only imagine. It must have. Because that's generally what happened. And we see this today as well. Mother's hopes for a child expressed in their names. You know, like blessing or fortunate or whatever the name is. Or beauty. There are women that have these names. There are men that have these names as well. And it can usually sometimes be an expression of what the mother hopes the child will be. Or what they will receive. So maybe Terza was a very beautiful looking child. And that was why she got that name. Maybe it was a mother's hope for her. And really was a hope that was realized, and we'll see that later on. So to go back to the beginning of the story, we need to know the beginning from the end. I told you a little bit about the end. This is how it unfolded. Numbers 27 verses 1 to 6 say the following. The daughters of Zelophehad, son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, belonged to the clans of Manasseh, son of Joseph. The names of the daughters, as I told you, Machla, Noah, Hogla, Milka, and Terza, they came forward and stood before Moses, this is way before the Joshua situation, Eliezer, the priest, same priest, the leaders and the whole assembly at the entrance to the tent of meeting and said the following. Our father died in the wilderness. He was not among Korah's followers who banded together against Yahweh, but he died for his own son and he left no sons. Why should our father's name disappear from his clan? Because he had no son. Give us property among our father's relatives. Mm. So Moses brought their case before Yahweh and said to him, Yahweh says to Moses now, you know, Moses brings his case before Yahweh. He says, okay, this is what's happening. And what must I do? Yahweh answers him and said, what Zalofihad's daughters are saying is right. You must certainly give them property as an inheritance among their father's relatives and give their father's inheritance to them. Hallelujah. What is happening here? Joseph's son Manasseh became a great tribe. Manasseh became a really big tribe and they consisted of many different families, remember named after their ancestors. So the firstborn of Manasseh, we are told, was Machir. His son was Gilead and Gilead went on to have a number of children. They were Jezer, Helek, Azrael, Shechem, Shemida and Hefer. Now Hefer went on to have a son whose name was Zelophehad and uh, Hefer probably had a number maybe of children and of sons, but Zelophi had a single out. And here we are told that he had five daughters and no sons. So the events 
which led to their challenge of the law, was that a census was taken. So right in Numbers 26, just before the daughters appear before Moses, there was a census that was taken. Now, the census that was taken in Numbers 26 was for the purpose of deciding on how the tribal possession and inheritance in the promised land, how it would be divided. Moses was preparing the people for their next journey. And that was the next phase of Yahweh's ultimate plan. The ultimate plan was to take possession of the promised land, divided among the tribes. But there had to be this census to determine, you know, which tribe would get what, how big their land needed to be, how big their tribe was, that kind of thing. You know, the Israelites had not yet even seen the land, but they were readying themselves to go up by faith and take the land. The previous generation, we are told, has already passed away, and now they were to fill their divine mandate. So Numbers 26, verse 29 to 34, it actually lists Manasseh's tribe. And it actually says that Zelophehad's name was there. It is there in Numbers 26. But but all his, you know, brothers have children mentioned next to their names, but Zelophehad's name, basically, there's a blank space. It's just Zelophehad, full stop. He has no sons. So he's skipped over in the census because he had no sons. He had children, but no boys. So sons only were listed in this census. Now, that's a patriarchal expression earlier on I said to you there was not not matriarchal matrilineal expression we find this in you know different aspects and different places in the Old Testament but yeah it's very much a patriarchal system you know only boys were going to be inheriting so sons listed in the census no space for daughters because the law set in place stated the following if a man dies without sons a male heir will get to redeem the land. Therefore, father who had no sons would have his name removed from the tribe. His legacy would ultimately disappear and his name would be forgotten. Now, I want to say to you that this was seen as actually a curse. To be removed or lost or cut off from among the tribe is a big deal. It's seen almost as a curse. Zolofi had is not cursed. You know, he, he hasn't done anything wrong. He hasn't done anything bad. But it was seen as though his name would be lost. And that losing of that name was seen as a terrible thing. And this is even why there is the law stated in Leviticus 25 called called the Leverate marriage. And it was, remember, where a brother would raise up children with the widow of his deceased brother. And they would name that children after the brother who had passed away. And so that the brother's name would not be blotted out or forgotten from Israel. And it seems a very scary law. I don't know about you. It is quite a scary law, but but because we can't really appropriate this in our modern times. But in those times, in the ancient world, you know, there were certain things that were done that made sense. And Yahweh didn't want the name of anybody, of his people to be removed just because, you know, they died young or they died without children. Of course, the Torah also states why for certain things you could have your name removed, but then that was seen as a curse. This is just a situation where, you know, there might not be children, there might not be sons. So Yahweh makes the way for these things to kind of be. And so the rule of law up until this point that we meet Zelophead's daughters was that there was, as I said, a patriarchal line of inheritance. And this was standard practice among the Israelites. This was given, you know, in Torah. And this concerns Zelophead's daughters. Their convictions were so incredibly strong that they rose up and challenged the law. And this was done, firstly, I want to say, this was done orderly, respectfully, and according to the correct divine mandate. Think about it. And this is a deep spiritual principle that we need to appropriate to our own lives. Their appeal was to divine legislative authority. Before you read on, and before I go on, I want to really pause here. That is why Paul also speaks about legal prayers, prayers and petitions. You know, Hezekiah, when he's attacked by the Assyrians, he lays out, he goes to the temple of Yahweh and he lays out the letter that was sent to him by the Assyrian general. 
he lays it out before Yahweh and he he does a divine legislative appeal where he says to Yahweh, look at what the Assyrians have done. Look at what they are saying. They are directly speaking against you due to the fact that I'm bringing this before you. You know, Yahweh, I'm appealing to you to act not only for your people, Israel, but for your name's sake, because this is a legal situation and I'm petitioning you there is this reality that we can and we should be living in today some things are spiritually legal and some things are divinely legislative and we need to be able to tell the difference and when we go before Yahweh making a divine legislative authority appeal and this is exactly what they did it was Yahweh's law that governed the way that the inheritance would be. So they took their concerns to the mediator of that law, and that was Moses, who was responsible for giving the laws to Israel. Only Yahweh, who was God and king at that stage over Israel, could overturn what he had commissioned. Now, a king would come later in in a physical reality, but still, Israel was governed by the heavenly king, Yahweh, who had given a divine law. They had to appeal to him. And so as these women stepped forward, they held deep concern for their father and for his name, because that is how they also appeal. Why should he be forgotten just because he had fathered five daughters? Daughters are not a curse, they're a blessing. So his name and his symbol of being part of the tribe of his ancestors, his person would be forgotten. Their family would disappear. And so their request for inheritance rights was also an extension to preserve their family heritage. That is so important. To preserve their family heritage. And that was what the appeal was all about. You know, it's not just going, oh, I want to, you know, have these requests for inheritance. It's also saying, well, you know what, hey, I also actually want to have this preservation of my family heritage. So many families and individuals think about this very same thing today. They think about, you know what, what our surname be forgotten. Many people don't want to let go of their maiden surname or even among their families who do not have children. The family surname will be lost or forgotten. And you know what? This is the appeal that they are making. I know that this is something that people today actually experience. It is something that is really, really on their heart too. It is something so, so deep on their heart. They go, you know what? My name and my family name, as it was lived and as it was experienced, will be forgotten. And that is the truth. Okay, so this is what is on their hearts at this time. So we've we've kind of, you know, tapped into what they were thinking in that moment. Going, yes, my family name is going to be lost. It's going to be forgotten. But as a righteous leader, Moses took the case before Yahweh. He didn't react in anger. He didn't act in aggression. And that is something that we need to take for ourselves as well. He didn't rebuke them. He didn't consider them wrong for speaking up. In fact, their request is taken for Yahweh and Yahweh himself changes the law. And how special is this? Yahweh answered Moses by saying, what Salofi had daughters say is right. What Zelophehad's daughters say is right. So the Hebrew word that is used for right here is very, very important because it means upright, it means honest, and it means indeclinable. So that's what the Hebrew word for this word means. So Yahweh says what Zelophehad's daughters say is right. And so the Hebrew word that's used for right means it's upright, it's honest, and it's indeclinable. Their heart posture was right, and it was honest, and their claim held eternal value. Yahweh said to them, you shall give them, and and this is what Yahweh answers Moses back. He says, you shall give them Nahala, which is the, the word for the word for their father's inheritance, and it shall be them. You know, it should be theirs. It was a big moment because constitution was being written here. Constitution was written and women in Israel would now inherit land for every single generation among 
God's holy people. Yahweh wrote here constitution. He wrote here. The principles of Israel's law were now set out and the legal rights of women within the sphere of property law and inheritance were completely clarified. This moment was not just about them, but with their boldness and their courage to step forward and to speak up, every single thing changed. What we cannot forget is that this act was one of deep, dramatic faith, and they appealed to be considered worthy heirs, worthy as women, worthy because they were daughters, and unlike those who had perished in the wilderness, they believed the promises of Yahweh. These daughters believed that the promised land would be theirs before they had seen it and before they had even claimed it you know this is incredibly unique faith they're going forward and they're saying we want this because we believe by faith that it will be ours and because i believe by faith that it will completely be given and matthew henry and i want to you know have a nice little quote here from him because he says something so beautiful about them he says that they had an earnest desire of a place and a name in the land of promise and this the land of promise was a type of heaven And by this claim, they laid hold on eternal life. Indeed, they were five wise virgins because the land as, you know, kind of seeming to be this type of heaven, you know, was kind of this claim to saying, we want this. We want this property law. We want these rights. And this is a kind of eternal life. And it's a kind of way of saying, you know what, we are going to be five wise virgins and we are standing here today because Because there is something that is in our hearts that's incredibly deep and we need to go forward to speak up. Now, how is this? Yahweh says what they said was right. It was upright. It was indeclinable. There was no way that it could be declined because it was right and it was good and it was honest. And not only were they asking for this claim and this inheritance in the promised land, but they were also really, really asking, you know, I don't want my father's name to be forgotten. We don't believe that that's what should happen. So Numbers 36 verse 1 to 4 says the following. The family heads of the clan of Gilead, son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, who were from the clans of the descendants of Joseph, came and spoke before Moses and the leaders, the heads of the Israelite families. They said, When Yahweh commanded my Lord to give the land as an inheritance to the Israelites by lot, he ordered you to give the inheritance of our brothers, the had to his daughters. Now, suppose they marry men from other Israelite tribes. Then the inheritance will also be taken from our ancestral inheritance and added to that of the tribe they marry into. And so part of the inheritance allotted to us will be taken away. When the year of Jubilee for the Israelites comes, their inheritance will be added to that of the tribe into which they marry, and their property will be taken from the tribal inheritance of our ancestors. Now, there was a big dilemma here because of course Yahweh now says that the property laws must change and that woman now could inherit if a man had no sons. So the family of Zolovi had came forward and said, well, actually now there's a great dilemma because our tribal territory will diminish. And the tribal territories were actually to be incredibly fixed and they were fixed in ancient Israel. They were not to pass from tribe to tribe because this was Yahweh's order. The order was that it needed to be completely fixed. And so the tribal divisions, they were chosen by lot, remember, and they were considered divinely positioned. There were lots chosen for each tribe and then the families of that tribe would inherit according to that lot. And so when women married, there would be this conflict because they would take their tribal inheritance to another tribe and this meant that tribal sovereignty would actually result in a conflict because they could you know the the inheritance could be right say in the middle of the tribal inheritance of a particular clan and then it's now just suddenly going to another tribe and this would cause a really big problem and also Yahweh didn't want land to be swapping between people he didn't want it to be like that that's why the year of jubilee was so important as well because it would be that it needed to come in you know this is this is the reality I was saying you know the law is that that woman could inherit but now we have this problem because you know land would be swapping this is this is not a good thing 
It was just really not a good thing. So Yahweh added to the instructions. He had to add things. So another new part of the constitution has been written by this. And he stipulated the following. He says, this is what Yahweh commands for Zelophehad's daughters. They may marry anyone they please, as long as they marry someone within their father's tribal clan. No inheritance in Israel is to pass from one tribe to another, for every Israelite shall keep the tribal inheritance of their ancestors. Every daughter who inherits land in any Israelite tribe must marry someone in their father's tribal clan, so that every Israelite will possess the inheritance of their ancestors. No inheritance may pass from one tribe to another, for each Israelite tribe is to keep the land it inherits. Now this is in Numbers 37 verse 6 to 9. These women took it one step further and they stayed in obedience to Yahweh's word. They actually, we are told that they married their cousins and that their inheritances stayed within their own tribe and also even further than that within their own family clan. Really cool. These girls had such upright, honest hearts and they did the right thing. When Yahweh said, this is it. You know, they did what he said and they even took it further, marrying their cousins so that their inheritance wouldn't go far outside of their family line. Not even their tribe they were concerned about, but also their family. They were very concerned about their family. But what is incredibly special is the question that I always ask, where can we find them? Biblical women often appear in the pages of the Bible and we see them there. But we sometimes yearn to see them elsewhere. Eventually, we can actually see them. We can see them on a map. You see, because these girls, their inheritances continued for many years to come. And eventually, their homesteads grew into great cities that existed throughout the time of settlement into the kings, the time period of the kings. And eventually, they disappeared. Their cities disappeared, you know, at the time of exile, when many cities disappeared, when the Jews. Jewish people, as they became, went into Babylon, into the exile Babylon, and emerged as the Jewish nation because it was Judah that went into exile. And scholars, though, have sifted through archaeological evidence to uncover the territories of these girls. And it's so cool because we can actually find them on a map, which means these women really did live. They were really alive. So for the people that say, you know, the Bible is just made up of these make-believe stories, not so. We see Terza's inheritance, and it's like I said to you earlier on, her name means beautiful or pleasant. It is actually, you know, beautiful because we can actually see her. Her city is so easily identifiable on a map. It is frequently mentioned in the Old Testament. It is the capital of the Northern Kingdom, hosted Omri's palace, which, you know, the ruins they have discovered today. And it is also referenced in Song of Songs chapter 5 and verse 4 where it says you are beautiful my love as lovely as Terza and as comely as Jerusalem. Terza continued as a royal city for the Omride dynasty or the Omride dynasty until his ancestors moved the royal city to Samaria and so Terza's inheritance was so easily identifiable continued right up until the you know even the Assyrians camped out in Terza because it was well situated there were many people that lived in a city so think about it her small inheritance that she inherited in this place became a city so her family you know was never ever forgotten her family emerged to really really become more than just her and her husband and her children but their children and children after that and people moved in and it became a great big city and it was named after her which is really amazing now Machla is also located in the Jordan Valley alongside her sister Terza's inheritance it is so likely that the biblical city of Abel Mehola as we know it today it's called that it's likely that that is or was the city where Machla was. Remember that names begin to change and they do take on differences. So this is the area where the prophet Elisha came from. Abel means brook. So her inheritance and later would be her city was built on the water which provided necessary water supplies to her area. So Abel we could say it would have been Abel Machla, but the name changed. 
was a city built on the water which provided this brook to her city, which is really incredible because now we're almost getting that visual of what it would have looked like. What about her sisters? What about the rest of them? Well, archaeologists have actually excavated at, at I've told you this already, Machla is located in the Jordan Valley. So we're going to move on. Archaeologists have excavated at Samaria, where Omri, that I told you about earlier, and built his new capital. And at the site, they discovered, and this is really fascinating, they discovered what is now called the Samarian Ostraka, which refers to over 60 documents that were actually discovered in the city. And with most ancient material sources, these dockets relate to taxes. This is the kind of thing we find, you know, when there's archaeological digs, is taxes and royal administrative documents and legal affairs. Fairs and nowhere is mentioned actually in the Austrica as a clan. So again, she had her inheritance and then her family grew and grew and grew and it emerged as a clan. But unfortunately, the Austrica only tell us that it's a clan. They don't tell us where the geographical location is. And uh, there was also a taxpayer from the tribe of Hogla, and who was also mentioned in the Ostrica. And scholars have identified Hogla's territory as being the modern day village of Yeset. And so we have these girls on the map, on the map of the Bible. Sadly, Milka disappeared from the map completely. And there's no archaeological evidence found for her city or for her clan. But you know what? Just because it's not been discovered yet doesn't mean that new evidence might not be revealed in its time. I truly believe it will be. So what do we get from all of this? What do we get from the fact that these women were there, they inherited, and they had these great clans and great cities named after them? As a Bible scholar myself who is interested in women's stories, I am always trying to find our girls. Where are they? Our women of faith. As much as we see them in the Bible itself, it's incredibly thrilling to find them elsewhere in the pages of history, even if that history is a map. The daughters of Zalofi had made a mark on history forever. You know, they challenged the law. They created change for future generations. Not only did they marry their cousins to protect and to honor that law, and we see that, but actually their land allotted to them really, really just you know, reveals so, so deeply, reveals that, you know what, they had this land and it grew and it grew and it grew and it grew. And it would be incredible places where people truly would grow into these big clans and where they would just be for many, many generations. And it was really, really incredible. And this was what we see with them. They appeared as women who didn't only just inherit this land there, but their homes developed and their places grew and their clans were not named after their husbands, not named after their uncles, not named after their fathers, but were named after them. Clans named after women. Can you imagine in the ancient world? It is unusual and it is unique, especially in Israel, but it did happen and it happened with them. Cities named after their clans, cities that retain their names of their founding mothers. Think about it. Every time you were born into that village or of that clan, you would hear the story of your ancestors. You would hear about Noah or Hogla, Tursa, Milka, Machla. How did this city get founded, you know? You know, ask your parents, you ask your grandparents and they tell you about these women. They went forward, they asked for their inheritance, they started living here and today we live here and this is their story. These stories would truly empower your beliefs and teach you about the matriarchs of your ancient times. But they still do that today. They reveal a different view of God's woman than what is traditionally taught to us. They reveal that women were truly there and biblical women truly lived. And they were more powerful than we thought and more influential than we have ever believed. And there were also leaders whose legacies stretched on for a very, very long time. It has been so incredibly good to go with this through, <laughs> go through this with you today. You know, it has been incredible to just consider the legacy of these girls. And as we do that, let's take a moment to reflect on that and to also offer up a prayer. Father, we want to say thank you so much for these daughters of Zalofi Had, who were matriarchs of faith, who went forward, Father, and who spoke truth. They spoke deep truth. 
And Father, they spoke to the truth of we don't want our family to be forgotten, but we also want our inheritance. And they they wanted it, Father, even though they had not seen it. Today, increase our eyes of faith as the faith that they had to go forward and to ask and to, Father, desire something that was just going to be seen in the future i pray that we ourselves would have deep faith for whatever our needs are today whatever our wants are today whatever our hope is today may we have it by faith father may we have the faith to really really step up when you call us to step up may we also have the faith and the bravery to go forward when we need to speak up whether it's in our families whether it's in our communities whether it's for justice whether it's in our spiritual walk wherever it is father give us the faith and also give us the boldness may we move forward with courage and bravery to do the brave holy and messy things sometimes so father we thank you for the examples we thank you that you have given it to us too and we give you all the glory and we give you all all the praise we thank you father and we just worship you in the mighty name of yeshua messiah amen Thank you so much for being with me today. It has truly been good to be with you. Don't forget to go on over to our website, treasuredinheritanceministry.com and get the notes for this teaching. I'll put them up there. And also don't forget to subscribe to the channel that you are presently on so that you can receive more teachings and more teachings like this and others. So until next time, shalom, shalom, and may Yahweh bless you.